Hello and welcome to episode 3 of a series where I'm taking a look at the Rust programming language using the book, the Rust programming language, as my sort of primary uh, method of, of learning in addition to just bringing people's attention to the fact that the book is also available on the doc, the uh, Rust lang.org website. So we're currently in the scheme of things. We're, we're still hovering around chapter three. Uh, I'm hoping this is going to be a short episode today because, again, I'm going to just pick uh, a particular concept from chapter three. And it's in the area of control flow. So I want to take a, a look at specifically if express if expressions you know like branching and look at some examples and just um, go through and just think about the various implications and like I said this is based around this section of the booklet down to where it starts talking about loops and I'm going to do loops in a separate episode so let's go back to Visual Studio Code just for convenience, I'm going to set, um, create another cargo container, uh, which I'm going to call branches. So we've now got that. I'm going to switch to the branches folder. So now when I do my um, cargo run, it will be running what's currently in there. Now at the moment, it's just got that main source file which has by default hello world in it so you wouldn't be surprised if you've seen my previous episode to know I've already worked through this on my laptop independently and I've got an RS file here a Rust file ready to go so we're going to copy this and we're going to copy this into the branches folder that has just been created by cargo so I'm just going to swap this out. So now we're good to go. So now I can open this in Visual Studio. So let's do that. Make sure I've got the right one here. And in previous episodes, I've gone through already the, the structure of, of what happens when you use Cargo. So. If you've jumped on board at this episode, I would suggest going back and looking at the early ones. Okay, so I've been through, um, typed up the code from the book in this section, and then I've added my own comments here. So <laughs> as, as a form of sort of script as I go through this, but um, the good thing is you can also see this as well on screen. So. If you've worked in other programming languages, you you should already be familiar with some form of if keyword and how if can be used in combination with other parts of the language to control the execution of blocks of code, to control branches, um, and they all focus around some condition that you're testing for. So all if expressions start with the if keyword, they're followed by some sort of condition to be tested for. Uh, blocks of code associated with conditions being met in an if statement. So you can see here. <clears throat> so if this condition is met of the value number, which currently is three, you can see I've used a let statement here to set that um, so if the number is less than three uh, less than five sorry um, then this gets executed here the condition was true um, these blocks of code are also sometimes called arms interestingly enough the term arms i hadn't come across in coding uh, before i started to learn rust so i don't know when that started being a thing generally if that's a term they use in other languages uh, here you can see there's a single else expression which gives you 
an alternative blocker code to execute should the condition you're testing for up here prove false. And in a moment, if we change the value bound to the number variable to say five or greater, we can see the execution of the else block. Um, now without this else block or else clause, uh, the condition would skim simply skip over the block for the true condition if it wasn't true. So if we didn't have this here, uh, one or two things could happen. Um, if the condition was true, then we'd get this. If the condition was false, then we'd get, it would just move on. So the else, this else clause gives us a second option for false. And obviously based on this condition here, the execution is going to change. So let's just make sure, yep, this is saved. And we're just going to run Whoops, what happened there? That's better. So just ignore this other bit for the moment. I've put everything in a, a single file to avoid me retyping stuff as we're going along. So currently the condition is true. Now, obviously, if I change, say, the value here and then just resave that. And we have a, a false condition because number is five and that's less than, um, so if the number is less than five, then execute this condition. If the number is not less than five, then execute that one. Of course, another way we could achieve that or, or that would happen is obviously if this tested differently here. So that's the first sort of major example of, of an if statement in in combination with the else clause and as I mentioned before if we didn't have the else clause here then if this condition proved false then it would simply skip this block of code if it's true executes it so you can probably gather that um, Knowing that, knowing that you can simply just have a, a condition you can test for and execute a piece of code, you can do stuff like this where you can say, um, you know, test for one thing here and then as a result we get this. If this is not true then we get nothing. So it's currently executing this. Our a number is three up here, so we're moving now to this block of code. So if I now change this to four, you can see, or you know already what's going to happen here. Um, and we re-execute this. We it just doesn't execute that statement at all, so I don't get any anything printed out there. Now the other thing to be mindful of is when you're doing things like testing for conditions and it's an easy mistake to make and, and all of us have, have made it over the years with different programs is the test here. So you'll notice it's double equals. Um, it's not a single equals where we're assigning three to another number. It's this double. So just be careful of that. It's easy to forget and do something like this. Now let's just see what happens if that was to be a thing. Yeah, so if we start doing that, then yeah, it, it's, it's great because it's saying, well, actually here you may be trying to compare for equality. 
So it's it's also sort of expecting certain things by the code structure. So because of the way this is structured, it's expecting some sort of Boolean condition. Um, in in the in the same way, but you can see up here the variable is not Boolean. We've defined it as an integer. So it's nice because it's saying, well, one possibility is, you know, you're, you've defined your variable completely wrong, but probably you actually really wanted to test for equality. And just to, to show here, so supposing we were doing a, you know, like a, a Boolean test to say if this is true. So in this format, and we'll talk about ways which you can test for the for something being zero or not, because sometimes in if clauses that there's sometimes a need to test to see if a condition, uh, if an, an integer variable is um, not equal to zero. And it's easy to make a mistake there. And instead of testing to see if it's not equal to zero, doing um, like a, a boolean style conditional check so if we try and do this we'll get a slightly different error because there's no other code there so it's not going to offer us the suggestion that we might want to compare for equality it's just assuming that we've made a mistake here and we were trying to do some sort of boolean conditional test but we've defined the integer as a as a, an in, sorry we've defined this variable as an integer obviously what we could do here um, and this won't make any sense because we'd, we'd obviously want to change this accordingly to saying you know the value is true if we change this to the word true then we wouldn't get the error anymore. But um, what I wanted to really show you here is, so this would be the code that would look like, supposing you just wanted to check to make sure that your integer was not zero. That's what it would, that's what it would look like. Now, of course, you would change this accordingly and say the number was not zero, or we could use that, I suppose, in there for our wording. There you go. So if we change the tested condition below to test for a Boolean condition on an integer, we saw how Rust generates an error. And we can see how if we wanted to test if the variable was not zero, which would be my one reason why you you may have well I you know I may have attempted to do some sort of Boolean check. Um, we would want to do this for an integer variable by using this condition to check and as I've said here it's good time to think about what right might infer in the example where we test for a boolean and what is expected so I'm finding this this is fascinating me which is why I'm spending so much time over this um, I, I'm not sure if I've seen a language language checking that's quite so helpful um, and in some instances almost knows what you're trying to do. Now we can use else if in combination with an if to sort of extend the clauses. You can see here we had like the sort of either or. So if you know if this is true, then do this. If if it's not, if else, then do this. We can build that up. So we can check several conditions. So we can start off and we can, in this example, we're looking at whether something is divisible by a certain number. 
and when we do that it's going to go down from the top down so it's going to check you know is it divisible by four is it or else if it's not is it divisible by three or else if it's not is it divisible by two and then if it's not any of those then it's not divisible for by four three or two so there's a couple of issues here with this sort of structure and you may be able to see both certainly you probably spotted one particular problem at a certain point multiple if else if arms can get really messy so a collect correctly constructed match statement as we've seen in the previous episode we've seen match already might be a better choice also notice if we use else if because it it sort of filters down in this waterfall fashion almost where it's sort of testing for this if it's not true it moves on to the next one now if it's true because this is all in a, a sort of single if with a series of else ifs and then final else condition if this is true then it's going to just break out of this so to speak and not check for anything else so it just executes a single arm on here in fact it, it in, in some ways you could say it's the opposite of a waterfall um in that it's you know once it gets to the the criteria that it meets that's it, it stops there it's not cascading down through and then checking for the next thing there's better control structures that we could use and we'll talk about those in in other episodes so it only executes one of a possible four and does not check for other divisibles once the first is found so at the moment you can see it's checking here six so is six divisible by four well it's not is it divisible by three well yes it is now it's also divisible by two but it never gets there because it jumps round it breaks here and just starts off executing below code below that so yeah just again something to think about when you're structuring and using if else ifs you know is it getting messy is one but secondly because of the way the if else if else works are there other things that I should be checking for beyond where it bounces out, where it breaks out? Now, the other interesting use at this point, and I'm sure as we go through other episodes, we'll see interesting uses of if, if, else, if, and so on, and alternatives, is you can actually use an if statement as part of a let statement. So you can do a conditional binding based on the outcome of the if expression. Here the condition is true or false. But notice what happens if you change the types in the arms so they don't match. So obviously what's happening is because it's it's binding. So at the moment we're saying let condition be true. And it's going to set the conditional number if the condition is true. And we're just using this Boolean check as a way of easily illustrating this. Obviously, we might have a different condition in here in real life. But this is just to illustrate the difference of what happens between having a true condition and a false condition. And a, a Boolean variable is a good way of just illustrating that. So at the moment, the condition's true. So it's five. If I was to change this to my so my boolean condition resolves to false here so and then doing a run okay so the value of condition number is six no surprise there now what happens if i do this How is Rust going to respond?
Okay, so that's interesting. So it's expecting the value here to be an integer, but it's detected here a um, a string. And that wouldn't matter. Let me just see what, whether it what happens here regardless of the condition. And that gives them us some, 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 us some idea as to how Russ might check these things. So yeah, it doesn't matter. It's purely looking at the way the code is structured within, within here in relation to what it might be expecting here. It's not caring about, oh, you know, in this form, this isn't going to run. So why bother? It's not working like that. If I reverse this, do we get anything different? So slightly different error there. Now the question is, did I accidentally change this back? Gonna make sure I didn't type something wrong here. Oh, I have done that actually. That might be it. Let me just do. That. I might have had double. Yeah, that's better. Okay, yeah, I had a double um, speech mark in there, which happens when you're using auto uh, formatting. So. You can see here that that it's reversed. So what it's doing is it is looking at it's inferring what to expect by what sort of variable it hits first. So here it's saying it's an expected string, but it's found integer because here the first part of this conditional loop as it's checking the code so this conditional branch is saying well this is a, a string so I would expect this to be a string if we reverse it and put the string down here and the number here it's expecting the integer and then it finds a string so that's how it's working that out and this is one thing I want to do in these episodes is deliberately break things so you get familiar with the sort of errors that this will kick up and that's why oftentimes it's taken me a lot longer to get through stuff which normally you know if you were just explaining this quickly this would probably take you 30 30 second, seconds couple of minutes to explain because i want to show you what happens when you um when you know rust experiences the unexpected uh, and how that happens so hopefully that's been helpful. That's all I really want to cover in this episode. In the next episode, I'm going to be looking at loops. So thanks once again for watching. Bye for now, and I will see you in the next episode.